simultaneous live stream through Facebook. So um, those of you out there in the social media world, um, you can watch and listen through Facebook. But if you want to be able to uh, communicate with us and, and comment, um, give us your input and feedback about um, the uh, work on the strategic energy plan um, and this community partnership we're aiming to build, we'll kindly ask that you register through Zoom and join the meeting in that way. Jeff, is it possible to put on Facebook, maybe in the uh, comment section, um, a contact um, if people have like, they're watching and they just want to make a comment, if they don't want to make it on that, if they want to send something possibly? Well, it, it does look like um, viewers can enter comments in, okay. in the Facebook uh, feed. Um, whether I'll be able to capture those or not is... Uh, remains to be seen. <laughs> okay, we can always go in and just photo, you know, take a snapshot. Right. Okay, well, it's kind of low tech. I guess we can go ahead and, uh, and start without, um, you know, risk of too great a chance of leaving anyone behind. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and share the screen here um, with the slides. And let's see how do we do that. Sure. <clears throat> okay, can everyone see a uh, slide in front of them with a big green? Good, okay. All right. Um, so welcome to this uh, community partnership public listening session related to development of the City of Greensboro Strategic Energy Plan. Um, I am Jeff Sovich, Senior Planner with the City of Greensboro Planning Department. And I'm joined by Dr. Vicki Faust, who is Chair of the Greensboro Community Sustainability Council. And at this point, um, I would, uh, I guess I will go ahead and uh, present these two or three in introduction slides and then hand it off to Vicki. And uh, then we can proceed through the introductory introduction presentation and then get on to the most important part of this uh, meeting today. So um, to give you some background, in December of 2019, the city council adopted a resolution uh, calling for development of a 20 year strategic energy plan for the city of Greensboro um, with the deadline to present that draft to the city council within one year. And of course, as we all know, um, in March of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic response uh, began here in Greensboro and literally upended everything that everyone knew and relied on in the world. Um, and so our effort to launch this planning process was delayed. Um, and uh, in September of last year, the city council uh, adopted a follow-up resolution that extended our due date, due date for submitting the draft plan out to August of this year. And that resolution uh, specifies that the uh, strategic energy plan should include steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from city operations by at least 40% from estimated 2005 levels by the year 2025 and steps to reduce energy consumption per square foot in city owned buildings by at least 40% from estimated 2005 levels by 2025 goals to reach 100% renewable energy in city operations by 2040, a robust and inclusive program of public engagement, outreach, and education, um, preparation of an updated greenhouse gas emissions inventory every two years, and publication of an annual progress report. There are some additional items that the resolution called for that we will uh, cover later on. 
Uh, the resolution also calls for creation of a diverse community partnership comprised of city staff, residents, corporate partners, and other interested stakeholders to collaborate and provide guidance in developing the strategic energy plan. Today's presentation um, is the initial steps towards um, assembling the community partnership, and we want to hear your questions, comments, feedback, concerns, uh, priorities, expectations, and so forth about what the plan should include. Um, and today is where we're doing that. And so I will hand it off to Vicki here. So to, I'm just going to give a brief overview of um, kind of the um, outline that we have um, put together for uh, developing this strategic energy plan. And um, I'm going to move through this um, hopefully relatively quick, quickly. So the, the point of this is um, for us to come up with a long-term blueprint um, to focus um, our efforts towards um, a defined energy vision. And ultimately our vision is a 100% renewable energy by 2040. Um, and the, um, the plan will articulate our goals um, and then develop strategies and actions to meet our goals um, and um, identify and allocate the resources that we'll need to actually uh, complete these strategies. Um, so there's a 10 step process. Um, I'm gonna go through that very quickly. Um, not here, this is just, no, there's 10 steps. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so the scope of the energy plan is for um, city operations. So this will include all government buildings, facilities, infrastructure, operations, transportation. And so things that the government has a direct influence on. Um, however, it does state in the resolution that we will um, have uh, incentivize um, Greensboro residents and businesses to also follow suit with our effort. So, next slide, sorry. Um, so number one, our first step is to form a leadership team. We met in, um, um, Jeff, the end of December, I think, um, yes. with, um, internal city staff and really um, had a meeting, same presentation we're doing today, same kind of um, listening session as we're doing today um, with a very large group of city folks, um, city staff. They're all uh, very excited about this um, uh, project. So um, we, we've got a lot of support from a lot of people high up in, in departments uh, and of course with the city manager's office and the city council. Um, and then another part of that leadership team will be our community engagement piece. Next slide. Um, so identify, engage um, stakeholders. That's one of the things that we're doing today. We had a listening session or a Q&A kind of thing uh, at the CSC meeting a few weeks ago. And um, this is a follow-up. Um, and we're really just uh, wanting to um, get ideas, expertise of people that want to get involved in some way. And... Um, kind of give you an overview of what's going on so that um, you understand the process and maybe um, can see where, where you can fit in and want to fit in. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and we also throughout the process will have um, engagement opportunities. Um, and one of the big, uh, uh, the purposes of this is to ensure transparency. So everyone's aware of where we are in the process and, and, and uh, what we've accomplished. Next slide. Um, so today we're in, in all of our meetings, you know, as informational, educational for our community partners. Um, also, again, we're very interested in soliciting input from the community because this is, um, you know, our community. Um, and then uh, to understand how stakeholders can or want to help. Um, types of engagement, advisory committees. Also, we're going to have working groups to kind of deep dive into some of these areas. Um, so talking about those areas uh, like transportation or um, uh, uh, water, building efficiency, buildings, lighting, that sort of thing. Next slide. Um, so this is just a, a recap of the um, resolution that was passed, the actual what the resolution directs um, the city to do. 
Um, you can read that, that's on the CSC website. And um, th this is kind of the overall overarching vision of this energy plan. Um, the, our, after today, our next big uh, step that we need is to I think we've lost Vicki. Yeah, we lost her for a little bit. Usually what she does is when she, she she has to click off and then she'll be back in, Jeff, you might have to let her back in because she'll have to shut it down and then okay. she'll come back in. That's what she gets for living out in the country. So we're in a brief pause waiting for um, Vicki Faust to hopefully get reconnected here. Sorry for the delay. Hi, Jeff. It's um, Kim Sowell. Can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to say I'm, I'm um, probably will have to jump off in a few minutes. I have a, a 4 p.m. meeting. But I just wanted to thank everyone. I looked at the participants list and I'm really pleased with the participation that we have um, in today's input session. So really want to thank everyone for joining in and appreciate your interest in um, partnering with us to make sure we um, you know, develop a, as best of a strategic energy plan as we can. And so we're looking forward to all of the um, suggestions, all of the input and um, Hopefully we'll have a really good product and something that we can um, take action on and develop some really good strategies and goals um, in making sure we, we reach our goal of being um, renewable energy um, by 2040. So thank you so much, everybody for joining in today. Um, I, I don't know what happened. I just, it just completely dropped. So I apologize for that. Um, thank you, Kimberly, for Speaking in my absence. Um, so um, again, we're um, our, our next big lift is going to be working to assess the current energy profile. This will help us establish our baseline of where we are, so we'll know how, where we, what we need to do to to move forward to reach our final goal. Um, and this will also enable us to um, really assess our, our greenhouse gas. Um, emissions now, and we can uh, backcast to a uh, former um, greenhouse gas inventories that were conducted to see what um, changes have happened in the last few years. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, after. Uh oh. Well, stay with us, Vicki. Jeff, is there any way you can fill in, or is there what you you would? Uh, I any... can try. Um, just hoping that Vicky can make it back. One, two. Come on, Vicky. All right. Well, I'll try to fill in until she um, makes it back and, and see how that goes. Um, so uh, in this 
next step, we'll be trying to make sure that we uh, have chosen some uh, readily comparable um, metrics in terms of uh, greenhouse gases per square foot or um, uh, kilowatts or megawatt hours per um, mile for transportation measures and things like that. Um, making sure that we have clear and measurable goals that are related to those metrics um, are identifying along the way the strategies that we'll be using for achieving those goals. Um, the goals are, are fairly clearly spelled out in the resolution, um, but we'll want to make sure that we have the, the strategies that we need in place to, to achieve those goals, integrating all of the input that we've received from our stakeholders um, to put together a, a good set of actions to use to achieve, to move those strategies forward. Um, publicizing the goals and strategies, um, making those a, a, an explicit part of the plan document. Uh, there's Vicki, okay. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. I closed everything I could possibly close that could be interfering with this. So I, again, I've never had this problem before. I do apologize. Um, identify uh, our priorities and um, um, uh, our actions. So once we um, develop our goals and strategies, this gets into minutia. What are the exact steps we're going to do? Um, and once we have our goals and strategies, how are we going to um, uh, um, rank the ideas in terms of what are we going to do first versus, you know, so to kind of Pareto. to look at policies, programs and, um, that are already in place, but also um, um, what's going on with different departments, what they have um, in terms of um, already with their strategies um, so that we're um, syncing there. Uh, and then we'll rank and evaluate options. And again, we'll get uh, community input on this um, to help um, uh, finalize those actions next. Uh, put together a finance strategy. So how are we going to um, uh, finance all of these uh, these um, actions that we're going to take? Or is it going to be uh, through the city? Or are we going to do... Um, anyway, there's a myriad of uh, mechanisms in place. We can discuss that at a further time, uh, a future time. Uh, next. Uh, develop a blueprint of actions uh, with a timeline. Uh, so this really is getting into the weeds. So um, uh, develop uh, operational responsibilities. So this will get into departmental level um, implementation strategies. Um, and again, incorporate this into other planning and budgeting efforts. And then um, next, um, a plan to evaluate. So how do we know that we're making progress? Um, um, will, you know, are we reducing a kilowatt uh, per square foot? Are we reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Are we reducing um, of gasoline, et cetera, that we're using? So um, again, these will be measurable um, uh, indicators. Um, and then that this will be um, evaluated and reported on a regular basis. And then um, we'll update the strategic plan when necessary to ensure, you know, things will change within 20 years. And then the last step will be to um, adopt and publicize our completed strategic energy plan. So we'll have a draft to submit to city council. Um, um, and we're, we have to have it done by August 21st, I think, 24th. Um, so, We'll have that, but before we actually submit it to city council, we uh, are anticipating doing a final uh, presentation to the community um, on the strategic plan. And then uh, our timeline for completion is um, listed. Um, again, we've already kind of developed the internal team. We're doing a listening session today um, an assessment of our energy profile. Again, the steps that I just went through with our final step being on August 24th. So we've got a very short window to get this all done. So all hands on deck. 
So, okay, so yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Vicki. Uh -huh. um, so today we want to hear your ideas, priorities, interests, expectations, especially as they relate to um, the strategies and actions that we can use to achieve um, the goals of reducing city operations, um, energy use, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And any concerns or questions that you have uh, about this process or about, um, about what city operations involves or what, why we're doing this or anything like that. Um, and today is, is a kind of a beginning step in a process of ongoing engagement um, in developing this plan. And we hope that you will take the opportunity to um, tell us what you want to see or have any questions. If, for instance, you want to um, be engaged in this process on an ongoing basis um, and participate in one of the working groups that we established, uh, comment to that effect in the chat window in Zoom, and we'll have that, we'll compile that list. Um, and also help us spread the word and get more people and organizations in the community involved. Um, if you have knowledge or expertise on any of these uh, subject areas, we would certainly appreciate uh, your, you sharing that with us. Um, and here is just a kind of a, a high level outline of what um, we're understanding as uh, city operations and the kind of categories um, that we should be thinking about today. Um, and this will probably kind of form the, the basis for our working groups um, and help, should help give you kind of a, a starting point for any ideas and, and comments um, that you may have today. So with that, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and open the floor to anyone uh, who'd like to lead us off. If you would, uh, on the first time that you speak, if you would kindly uh, state your name and uh, if you are representing a specific organization or uh, corporation um, in the community, uh, if you could kindly um, say that as well. We'd appreciate hey, Jeff, I don't yes. know who's monitoring the chat because yes. Douglas Bender asked a question uh, about five minutes ago and I see the hands that are going up um, in the uh, on the Zoom. So if uh, I saw Douglas Bender's question asked first and then I believe it might have been Lawrence and then Jeffrey and then Ithaca. Okay, let me, I guess I have to stop so, sharing in order to see the chat. I can do that for you, Jeff. Okay. Uh, Douglas Bender asked, can we help, uh, can you help us understand what the working groups are? Uh, Douglas, what's on the screen right now is kind of a, uh, an overview of, of the various um, working groups. Or at so, least a starting right, point for that. Yeah. And it'll get further into minutia as we go along. And then Elizabeth Link, do we have metrics for what our current energy use is for various functions? Um, yes, we don't have them for this presentation. Okay, and it looks like uh, Jeff Page has his hand up and also after him will be uh, Etsuko Kenefuchi. Good afternoon everybody, thanks for uh, hosting this meeting. Um, my name is Jeffrey Page and I am a uh, energy advisor with the Duke Energy Small Business Energy Saver Program. And uh, we, we go and meet the needs of the small business sector, um, specifically pertaining to uh, lighting, uh, HVAC and commercial refrigeration, uh, like i.e. restaurants, uh, grocery stores, et cetera. And one of the the, um, the touch points that you spoke about was lighting and kilowatt hour reduction and Duke Energy, as some of you or most of you may be well aware, um, provides heavy incentives for reducing just that, your kilowatt hours will they're actually uh, take care of portions of um, and sometimes substantial portions of the lighting projects and HVAC uh, uh, energy saving opportunities. So that's... Um, that's kind of what, what we bring to the table through that program. And 
the uh, city of Greensboro has, I want to say, 100 plus accounts at least, um, 100 plus meters or so that would qualify for those rebates. And the way it works is our energy um, advisors come into the facilities that you would want us to come into. Um, we look at your lighting, um, plug them into our system, and it kind of spits out a number in the end that talks about how much kilowatt hours you actually reduce and how much incentive Duke Energy will apply towards those uh, lighting and energy saving projects. So that's why um, I'm on this meeting today, just to kind of see what y'all's uh, goals were. And it seems like a lot of the goals that you do have fall directly in line with what the Duke Energy Small Business Energy Saver Program has to offer. So um, it's, it's definitely a hands-on um, experience, but in the end, we reduce um, hundreds of thousands of uh, kilowatt hours throughout the Duke Energy Program. We're glad you're on the call, Jeffrey. Great. Uh, Jeffrey, are you um, familiar with our um, energy management engineer, Sergey Kobolev? I know the name. I feel like I've been on a couple of emails that he was attached to as well. Um, and actually, um, Sophia Dubrovsky is what, uh, who introduced me to this, this group. Oh, okay, great. way to go, Sophia. Yeah, well, she's, my, she's one of my, my daughter's uh, teachers from a few years ago. I will put you and uh, Sergey in touch. Okay. And then just uh, reach out to Sergey to, to, to discuss further? Sure. Okay. Thank you, no, sir. I have not. Um, next up is Etsuko Kinofuchi. Go ahead. 4.30. Hi. Thank you, Jeff. I have actually, um, let me set my video, multiple questions, uh, one of which is that um, 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 I can probably bug out around that okay the uh, um i was wondering out of all these city operations if there are uh low hanging fruits in those and uh because one of the things that you need input for uh, is the priorities and so i was wondering um that and also um you know, in my previous conversations with Vicky, uh, this is beyond maybe beyond this uh, specific event and, and uh, the plan, but uh, city operations is relatively a small percentage within the city in terms of the um, how much we can save. Is that correct or, or, or not? Um, so I was just wondering how um, we can, you know, further help the city's mission to go energy neutral. Um, and also, uh, uh, Vicky, when you were talking earlier about um, incentivizing offshoot uh, the city's effort, and I just wanted to um, ask about that, like what, what kind of uh, incent incentive you're thinking about. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, there, there are always uh, things that we end up um, identifying when we review that, that we would classify as low hanging fruit or quick win opportunities. Um, and I'm sure that those will come up as we dig in and, and look at the places where we see um, opportunities to make very easy changes uh, that can, can help move the dial or um, changes that can, you know, have a big impact with, with a little bit of um, effort, um, things that we can do right away. Um, and most of those things tend to be, um, you know, behavioral, behavioral in nature rather than, um, you know, things involving large um, pieces of infrastructure or equipment or um, changes to the systems that we use. Um, and so the other part of your question, I guess, was more directed uh, toward uh, Vicki. Well, so and she was talking, um, asking about uh, how we would incentivize like uh, Greensboro residents and businesses. Um, Edsco, at this point, we don't really have a plan, but built into the resolution um, 
is a charge to provide recommendations for incentivizing um, local um, uh, residents and businesses to achieve similar pro um, um, progress with their greenhouse gas reduction and um, energy efficiency and renewable energy use as the city. So to kind of incentivize them to follow suit. Um, we don't know what those incentives are going to look like yet. We're so, that's part of the goal is to make provide recommendations. Right. Okay. Uh, looks like uh, Lewis Pitts has his hand up next. Lewis. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lewis Pitts. I uh, live here in Greensboro. I'm not representing any organization. And I guess I need to raise issues that are very uncomfortable with the elephant in the room, if you will, I guess in the context of community and grassroots input and, and power. And I guess to be blunt, the elephant in the room has already spoken, Duke Energy. And I think that there will be plenty of opposition from powerful corporate interest to accomplishing what should be our very um, ambitious goals here. Just like already today, President Biden has announced energy, uh, doing away with fossil fuel, promoting sustainable, and already there's quote an other side. So I'm not wanting to debate those issues now, but how can we be sure that there's going to be meaningful input from, if you will, the little people, the grassroots side of things so that the usual situation of the dominant corporate moneyed interest don't water this down when I think most of us know we face an existential threat. Good points. Um, well, I guess, you know, the first thing is that the city council is, um, is committed to this uh, 20 year strategic energy plan and has stated as an organizational goal to, um, to make these, to, to achieve these goals and to um, work toward Greensboro being the greenest city of its size in the Southeast by 2040. Um, so you know, that's, that's a pretty strong um, directive from our, our legislative body. And uh, we've got a, a strong team of city staff, um, many of whom are on this call right now, um, who are dedicated to moving these um, strategies and actions forward in order to achieve those goals. So we are going to work in all of the um, avenues and, and paths with where, wherever we can make progress and when we can make progress and uh, you know, push forward wherever we can. Um, like any, you know, large organization that is, um, you know, established for making a profit, Duke Energy has its objectives too. Those are not always um, easy to reconcile with the um, public purposes that local government exists for. So there will obviously be times when we can't make progress, um, but we're going to try to work for whatever ways we can. Is it possible that I could have another short comment or question? Sure, go ahead. I don't have the exact date, but I'm thinking five to seven years ago, the city was undertaking what seemed like a very powerful plan to, as I recall, use solar power involving some of the solid waste plants. Mm -hmm. And I saw as many as possible PERT requests or the state version of public records request on this. There was, a, there was a company coming in scheduled to do it. They put out the numbers. It was very clear. There was a number of how much would be saved by converting to that system. And all of a sudden the emails and, and the record 
fell off a cliff or something. I never have been able to find out what happened. And as you can, I'm sure, tell from my previous remarks, I'm very suspicious that Duke Energy killed that policy. So if there's anybody that could correct me if I'm wrong or set the record straight about what ended that effort that was going on and what can we do to be sure that the same thing does not happen. Thank you. Well, I think we have the right person um, on the call to uh, be able to respond to that one uh, pretty knowledgeably. Uh, Richard Lovett, would you like to take that? Yeah, um, currently the, the city of Greensboro actually has a, an operational solar farm out at the White Street landfill. It takes up approximately 15 acres of a, a previously used borrow pit. Uh, it was funded by a a third party that came in and is leasing that portion of the property to us and is taking that uh, solar energy and putting it out on the grid and basically uh, offsetting approximately 65, um, the equivalent of 65 homes annually uh, with solar powered uh, generated electricity. We also have a gas to energy plant now out at the landfill, which is producing approximately uh, I think, it, uh, I forget the exact kilowatts, but it's the equivalent to uh, removing about 1,500 homes from, uh, I guess, non-renewable resources by taking the landfill gas and converting that to electricity. And again, that was done through a private partnership with Renew Petra. Uh, they actually did both of the projects and are uh, currently, um, I guess, offsetting uh, close to 1,600 homes worth of electricity is now being provided uh, to the grid through uh, renewable uh, uh, means. I'll turn it back to you, Jeff. Okay, great. All right, um, and I guess next up is uh, Alan Hunt. <laughs> and I mean, I got little kids at home, so you never know how loud those kids can be. <laughs> um, so uh, I really liked um, what Mr. Pitt said I mean, it's very important, I think, uh, from a human rights space, of course, that's where I'm coming from, uh, human rights department in the city. We re recently renamed uh, from human relations to human rights. Still kept the same acronym, which was convenient. Um, so, I mean, for me, I definitely think the importance of the average citizen um, having input and not being overlooked, you know, uh, is very important. You know, we have one of the strategies um, that has been used by organizing uh, groups, you know, community organizing groups um, that many of us have been part of, you know, is to uh, try to amplify um, residents' voices through the development of community advocates, people that are in touch with, you know, uh, whatever local localized uh, population or group that is being impacted by whatever, you know, that issue is. You know, in this case is a obviously a citywide, a regionally wide issue. You know, the use of energy and access um, to goods and services, you know, is often impacted by consumption of energy, right? It's because those resources are, resources are being delegated towards, you know, uh, based on cost incentives. And obviously we're trying to reduce that um, impediment to access for people to pursue right, right to happiness and things of that nature. Um, my perspective of what is, you know, necessary um, in order to change some of this, and I don't know all the answers, I've not read all the materials, so if I'm being redundant, I apologize in advance, um, but for me, um, incentives like the use of, uh, like, upcycling city facilities and things like that for use of um, shared spaces uh, also is a one, is a huge way, of course, of reducing um, individual use or duplication of use of energy. Um, and the other and brick and mortar, reducing the brick and mortar uh, footprint, the carbon footprint of uh, the city. It helps also residents come together. And that's the human rights part of me that's coming out is I feel like whatever we do, whatever strategies we take when it comes to transportation or uh, re, um, reuse or redirected use of uh, facilities and resources is what can we do to um, not only enhance the standard of living of of our richest to poorest residents or economically challenged persons, how can we bring those people to the same spaces? 
you know, and, and obviously different communities are using things like light rail and things like that. And I know those are old conversations and maybe some of those conversations need, need to be resurrected. Um, but I just feel that's one strategy that I feel that will make this successful is not necessarily even as much the ecological benefit of reducing energy use, but how do we improve sort of the uh, human ecology side of it? You know, how are, you, how are we bringing people together in the age of social media? I feel um, my observation is people become more socially isolated, of course, with the advent of COVID that's compounded or amplified that experience. And so whatever we do, I feel if we can in a safe way, of course, depending on health and whatever that works out, the more we can bring people together through shared space, shared mobility, things like that, um, and maybe even the redirection of economic uh, experience, uh, opportunities like jobs for hard to employ individuals. People maybe have chronic, uh, chronically unemployed individuals. I've, I know of different jurisdictions that have actually been able to um, provide them with green uh, jobs, you know, that have uh, helped the cities and helped the individuals develop employability, you know, in their histories. And so that's just my two cents, um, give or take it. So thank you very much. Alan, good points. Very, very well spoken. Um, you know, we know that um, the negative impacts of climate change um, disproportionately affect people of color and low income households. Um, and so uh, as we um, move toward, you know, getting our um, energy use more sustainable in the city, we need to make sure that we're um, doing so in a way that doesn't um, make those disproportionate impacts worse. And we also want to do so in a way that all of our community can benefit, uh, can share in the benefits of um, the advances that we're making. Um, okay, so let's see, let's move on to um, Bill McNeil. No, no, Jeff Lawrence Morris had his hand up for the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Sorry, Bill. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. Uh, go ahead, Lawrence. I'm just, I taught economics at A&T for 34 years. I'm now retired and I'm uh, a member of the Guilford Anti-Racism Alliance. And I appreciate what Alan Hunt said and also what Lewis Pitt said. And I think that any project that the city undertakes that's of this magnitude, that besides just saving energy, not to make it sound like that's nothing, and the clearing the airs and so on, they've also got to figure out or always have in mind, how does this build racial equity? And equity doesn't just mean that today's life, your day-to-day -day experiences are better. Equity means we got to go back and understand what's the history in this nation and in this city of why, for example, what federal, local, and so on policies did that explains why home ownership and income and other assets in black households, people of color households do not begin to be a respectable fraction of what it is in white owned households. And we've just got to, that's if, that's part of the direction that Biden wants to take us. And I think we've got to be part of that. Very good points yeah. again. Um, and I, I think it's worth um, pointing out um, in, the, in the resolution that was adopted um, that one of the points um, that is there states um, that the plan should address cost burdens to ensure a just transition to renewable energy for all 
and prioritize at-risk populations. Just so that, you know, made it into the, into the overall concept for this uh, energy plan. Uh, so I think next up is uh, Bill McNeil. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, just uh, picking up a bit. Uh, I'm Bill McNeil. I'm, I uh, uh, work with others in the Greensboro Solar Power Now Coalition. But I, I want to pick up and reinforce the importance of racial equity and addressing disparities. And it may not be a direct city function, but um, using workforce development and the pursuit of green jobs and training for green jobs of the future is certainly something that we ought to include in this plan and work with the other um, uh, workforce development players that are active in the community, uh, GTCC and, and others. Um, but on a very specific point, and I don't see it on the screen, it, it may it may have been an omission in the city functions. Um, the city has done fairly good work starting uh, getting some electric vehicle charging stations in parking areas, parking lots. Um, I, I would hope that we could build on what we've learned, what the city's learned from the EV charging stations to expand that so that every rec center, every library, um, even incentivizing working with property developers in apartment complexes and um, uh, office parks um, uh, include EV charging stations in their, uh, in their development plans, but particularly uh, building on what we've done and, and getting EV infrastructure out into all city facilities. That, that's another element that I really like in the Biden um, climate plan that I'm sure fits the, the, the state has its EV infrastructure plan. Uh, the city can, it, it may not be really low hanging fruit as ESCO talked about, but there, it's fairly moderately low hanging fruit. Good comment, Bill, uh, on, on both points. Um, and uh, yes, we, we have some, um, some EV charging stations already installed and there are several more um, on the way. Um, and uh, you know, certainly uh, we look forward to seeing that um, uh, array of facilities continue to expand. Okay, uh, I think Jean Pudlow is next, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Jean Pudlow and I have recently connected with the Greensboro Solar Power uh, Coalition as well. I have a couple different points. Uh, one to build on Bill's point about the workforce development and we're likely gonna see more infrastructure involved in getting to this uh, goal. And it would be great to see vendors who, uh, or, who are, uh, if we can encourage minority owned vendors and, and try to have them as a part of the, um, that build up. But that might also take encouraging people to start those businesses because we don't have a lot of um, solar power, for instance, uh, installers that are owned by uh, people of color. So I, I support that workforce development effort as part of this. Um, a second point, we, I noticed on the initial leadership team list in the last uh, CSC meeting that there'd be several uh, representatives of Duke Power and I understand the importance of that for connecting to possibilities and strategy. Might it also be a good idea to have some uh, renewable energy um, providers and companies that um, develop that as part of that conversation and, par and part of that leadership um, perhaps representation from the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, uh, whose members are installers such as that and, and others. Um, thirdly, I was glad to hear that there will be encouragement of uh, solar, of energy use reduction and, and, and renewable energy to the community. 
and I'm hopeful that there might be a working group specifically focused on that um, to promote reduced energy by city residents and businesses. Um, so those are the main, main points I wanted to list, as well as throw in the idea of let's have lots and lots of parking lots covered with solar panels. Thank you. Okay, good points. Thank you very much. Jeff, there's several comments on the chat. So when you get a, a place. Okay, it looks like we don't have anyone who has a hand up um, in Zoom at the moment. So, or the, the main window of Zoom, I guess. Um, so we can go ahead and turn to the chat uh, comments now. Okay, um, Margaret Rowlett had asked a couple of questions. The first was, does Duke Energy have any programs that would support the city moving to rooftop solar on all of its buildings? Uh, I don't know if Jeffrey's still on the call um, and, or if he's um, the right person to speak to this. I'm not aware of any specific programs, but I'm not Duke Energy. Uh, you you are you kind of hit that nail on the head. I am actually not the right person to talk about this. We primarily focus on uh, um, three aspects again lighting hvac and commercial refrigeration and reducing the kilowatt hours associated with those avenues um i can uh dig around a little bit and see who if anybody would come to the table on those subjects and how that all can work but um i know i mean i know there's probably half a dozen um I, uh, emails that i get or you know posts on facebook about solar energy and um, from, from the residential, this is just personally speaking, but from the residential side, specifically, hey, your home qualifies for solar power, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, obviously there's a lot of key factors involved in that, like, you know, does your roof point to the sun the correct direction? But all of that would eventually, as far as I'm concerned, have to tie back somehow. If I can go ahead and, and dig through my sources and see if there is a person who would be involved in doing that specifically. Okay, thanks Jeffrey. Um, oh, hey, this, this is Matthew Cully with Renew Energy Solutions. Um, just while we're on the subject um, of the Duke, of Duke incentivizing solar, um, there is a solar rebate for the commercial sector, for the residential sector, and for the nonprofit sector. Uh, his, historically, the nonprofit sector has been pretty uh, unutilized. Most of the capacity is carried forward um, year over year. Um, this year, the city of Charlotte and this uh, city of Asheville, along with Buncombe County, I know are all um, coming out with portfolios of um, rooftop PV on um, city buildings that are going to cut into that rebate pool. Um, but it's definitely something um, that would be an option for 2021. And that's uh, 75 cents a watt for um, nonprofit. So, so Matthew, um, I, I'm familiar with that. I know the residential goes the this past year, it was like, you know, in less than an hour, all the rebates are gone. And pretty quickly with the, the commercial. So um, with the city, so the city qualifies for that nonprofit category? Correct. Yeah, we, wow. um, so we've actually worked with the city of Charlotte on a couple of projects. Um, um, most recently, the one, uh, new police station. And yeah, the, as a nonprofit, they would qualify for the nonprofit rebate pool, which I think as of the 21st, there were only six applications accepted for the 2021 nonprofit sector of the Duke rebate. Awesome, so it's, thank you. It's wide open, yeah. Thank you, um, Matthew. If you could um, maybe put, uh, I'd like to connect with you. Um, so if you can send me a private message on how we could get in touch, I would like to talk to you. Yeah, of course. Perfect. Um, let's see. Um, I'm, flipping through the, the, the chats. I know Margaret had another question. Um, if you don't find it, Sean's head's hand up. Okay, um, the other one was just, um, 
programs to install the rooftop lead to good jobs. That was just a comment. Uh, lead, and a couple of other people have talked about, you know, just uh, creating job creation, which is uh, great. Um, and then um, Skip was um, wondering if Deep Rep could comment on prospects to proliferate proliferate, right? I cannot say that word right now. Carbon-free nuke power, the new fail-safe standardized design, DOE, sanctified, distributed nuclear power plants. So these are the creating new power plants. I think in the, I, I didn't see anything in the IRP about that, but um, Jeffrey, sorry to keep leaning on you. Not a problem. Um, let me first clarify a couple things. Um, again, just stating back to you, that's kind of not my wheelhouse. I, I focus on those three. And, and um, the way it works with the Small Business Energy Saver Program is they contract out uh, specifically, they're contractually obligated to, Uh, this is Duke, that is, to a company called Wildan. And Wildan goes in and they, they handle the uh, lighting, HVAC, and commercial refrigeration aspects of businesses from grocery stores to, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, city hall, et cetera, et cetera. Depending. So answering the questions as far as the nuclear thing is concerned, that is, that is uh, I think someone said above my pay grade on this call once already, so I'll say the same thing. Um, and definitely over my head. Um, but you know, so our our company Wildan, who does all of the small business energy saver program, they function as Duke Energy representatives. Um, Duke says, "Hey, Wildan, can you go ahead into all these businesses that have a Duke Energy meter and look at what they have? Check out the options, um, the expense to reduce their kilowatt hours." Same type of a principle that they would do with solar where they're gonna apply um, uh, uh, rebates in some capacity to getting solar panels installed. Another company is probably actually doing the installation, but they're going to apply for those incentives through energy and however it, however it uh, operates. So um, sorry, I can't answer anything on the, anything on the nuke. Um, wish I could, because that'd be probably a really fun subject to discuss. Okay, and um, thank you. Um, um, Esco Kenafuchi would wanted to know um, uh, what the percentage of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions for the city operations within the whole of Greensboro. Uh, Jeff, I think I'm right. Two, two or three. Two to two and a half percent is about the what the typical um, percentage is. So. Um, yeah. And uh, she also just said that uh, just a comment about Duke with the uh, business, uh, residential and commercial being so competitive that they really need to change. I know that the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association is really pushing hard on Duke to increase the amount of rebates for uh, residential and business just because, again, they are so, I mean, this past year, I think they got gobbled up in less than an hour for the whole year. Um, so I, and don't quote me on that, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. So, but there are people working on that ESCO. Um, let's see. Um, okay, well, let's take a, let's go ahead and take uh, Sean McGinnis's uh, comment. Oh, next. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean McInnes um, from the Office of Sustainability at UNCG. Um, so I've been uh, relatively new to Greensboro. I've been here two years, moved here from Memphis, and have been um, attending meetings uh, with the Community Sustainability Council with Jeff and Vicki and Nicole and many other names that have been mentioned today. So. Um, you know, things that we have to focus on, it's it's great that we're kind of talking big picture for the city in, in, in general and our, you know, our community and citizens, but the resolution is 
has some of that in it, but it's really about the city's um, operations. And so some things that I can talk about here uh, that, that we've done that have helped it, and that we're trying to aim for, and I'm not making any promises because I don't pull the purse strings here, but um, you know, uh, we have three major contributors to our greenhouse gases. Uh, one is our um, commuters. So, you know, if you're going to, if you want to, uh, that's 30% of our carbon footprint, you're going to have to go all electric in your fleet. And honestly, that's what's going to, that's what, that's where we're heading. Um, no matter what political party is in uh, office, we're going to get, uh, the United States is going to get dragged into this in the future, one way or another, because when you look at it, uh, you know, we were, the only one of two countries that weren't in the Paris Climate Agreement until just a few days ago. So um, the rest of the world is moving this way and we're gonna get dragged into the clean fuel uh, and, and electric um, electrification of everything really. So, you know, I, I definitely agree with what everybody else has said about electrifying your fleet, uh, you know, taking advantage of grant programs like the Volkswagen mitigation um, grant program that's going on in the state and installing as, you know, as many um, uh, EV charging stations as you can. And then you probably might need to look into um, battery storage as, as well, for, you know, energy storage as well. Um, the other, uh, you know, uh, 30 or 40% of our carbon footprint is the energy that we purchased from Duke. And, uh, you know, there is just no way that rooftop solar is going to provide 100% of the electricity of any building. And so you're going to have to really work with other municipalities to pressure Duke to continue to install and speed up their implementation of renewable energy. Um, they're doing a fairly decent job. And uh, I think up until this year, uh, North Carolina was one of the highest um, percentage of, of solar in their, in our grid. Um, but that was only like five per two to five percent. I can't remember. It was very small. Um, and then we also produce some of our own natural. Um, we burn distillate fuel oil for our heating here. And that's another 30 percent. Um, energy efficiency. So things that have really helped us is determining that <clears throat> Any new building that we're going to construct on campus, you know, growth is always a problem, uh, both in, in square footage of our building space, but also in our population. And North Carolina is a growing state as far as people moving into it. Um, but uh, that's not really going to affect you guys so much, too much, Jeff, because you're just talking about city operations. But we decided years ago, long before I got here, that we would design uh, every building to lead certified standards. And that's something the city should probably put in writing. And I think you're going to really have to embed standards like that into any city policies. And I think putting that in paper so that future generations are going to have to follow those policies is, is really important. We've seen, um, we, we now have about 25% of our square footage is LEED certified. And although we haven't been entirely successful in reducing our total carbon footprint, we've managed to do it by 8% since 2008 per square footage, we have been really successful. And that is because of the energy efficiency that comes with building it uh, to a LEED certified building. So we've reduced our carbon footprint per square foot and per weighted campus user by over 20% in both of those categories. And that's what we have to report to the UNC system because we do have a goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and the rate we're going, you know, we would probably reach about 35 to 40%. Now the pandemic's sped that up a little bit um, if we can if we can stay on track but um, again we're you know with 40 percent of our uh, carbon footprint coming from Duke that's kind of out of our out of our hands right so um, you're really going to have to work on purchase power agreements you're going to have to look into things like um, the right of way and eminent domain possibly to and then of course you're going to enter into, you know, um, equity issues with um, finding land that you're going to want to build solar arrays, you know, and support Duke, Duke on that as well. Um, you know, social equity has been mentioned. Another great aspect that we've done is we have a, a historically underutilized businesses policy. And we have been, I, I could find the article, but we've been purposely, and, it, and it's in, in writing that we 
um, prioritize bids from uh, African American minority owned businesses so that when you're installing the EV stations, when you're installing solar, when you're doing efficiency work, that's where the equity side of it comes from, is from hiring and, and the job creation is coming from um, those types of policies and prioritizing those um, types of uh, businesses. Um, I feel like there was something else I, I was gonna say, but you, I think you've really gotta get things in writing um, and, and make this part of Sydney, city ordinances I think too, you should probably look at consolidation. So can you, uh, can you take a building off the, off the grid? Can you move people into, you know, maybe you build a new building and you, a little bigger, newer, efficient building and you move a number of offices into it and you get some things off of your, um, off your you know, you remove some meters essentially because you stop paying for those buildings. And, um, you know, that's kind of long-term, you know, I don't know how you're, <laughs> I'll be really impressed if you guys can get to 40% 40, um, 40 in, in the next four years, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's a, an admirable goal. But, you know, I think consolidation is a, is a really good idea too. Um, it's, it's something that we're always looking at with our space utilization. Um, so our, you know, we probably have more space than we really need to be honest, but we're also planning for growth on, on our campus as far as student population is concerned. But are, are the buildings being used, you know, during regular hours? Are they occupied and being used properly? And is there space that you can get rid of? Um, I think that's a really important factor as well. Um, okay, I've talked for about five or 10 minutes now, but, um, you know, you can, I'll put our link to our website if anybody's interested in kind of reading about what we've been doing on, on campus. You can read our carbon, greenhouse carbon. Uh, now I've talked too much, I can't even say any words our greenhouse gas inventory, and we have some strategic energy plans on there. Um, oh, Jeff, yes, yeah, sorry. The other thing that I was gonna say is that you should probably cr create some sort of green revolving green fund so that anytime you have savings from energy efficiency programs, those go right back into supplying more programs. And so we participate in the cities, uh, not the cities, the states, um, it's HB 1292, I think. It's the utility carry forward project. I don't know if that works with the city governments and I don't know if that's the exact house bill. It's um, state level. Yeah, it's but state. it might work for the city, I'm not sure. But I mean, obviously within this, you can probably work something out with your with yourselves so that anytime you know, you've made a, um, an investment that you reinvest that savings from your energy efficiency or even water, con you know, we've saved a lot of money in water conservation. Now that's not necessarily gonna reduce your carbon footprint, but it does save, uh, it's been saving us a lot of money that we can reinvest in other things. So, um, you know, fixing leaks, fixing condens condensate in our HVAC systems, um, all, all that kind of stuff. We're, um, you know, last year using the HB 1292 bill, we were able to reinvest over $800,000 into other utility savings projects, so. Uh, yeah, our team has already really talked about the a green fund. This is something that we're really, you know, um, all in favor of. So a great idea, Sean. And um, I did want to just ask you one thing. You said, you know, you save so much money with um, taking buildings offline and, you know, building new, more uh, uh, energy efficient uh, buildings. What about um, energy conservation measures that have been done on older buildings? Or are, are you guys doing a lot of that as well? Well, I mean, there comes a time when a building's useful life is at an end. And those are decisions that you're just gonna have to make um, a, as you come to them. So, um, you know, a lot of times it is gonna be cheaper to knock it down and to build a new building. It's just, it's that simple. And then you have to really deal with how you're managing the waste from that building. Um, and if you do lead certification, there are actually requirements that you manage and track the waste um, and, and you get credits for, do, for doing that um, towards your score. Um, you know, the one thing that we, we've done, we're trying to retrofit all of our outdoor lighting, um, so our lighting poles. Um, and I think one thing that we overlooked 
and I'll be honest, is that you know we're going to retrofit them to all LEDs, and but we didn't really think about maybe taking some down and just getting now a light pole doesn't have a lot of that isn't generating a lot of kilowatt hours, but um, we've got over. I think we have over 460 more lights to go on campus that we have to retrofit and we're trying to do it in the next eight years because um, but if we can find an investor to do it for us really quickly you know we need over hundred thousand dollars to do those retrofits um, so they're not necessarily cheap when you start talking about large amounts of, of, of lights on campus but um, but you know uh, Retrofitting street lights, I think. I don't know if that's what something you're considering, Jeff, as a city-owned property. Um, but that would be something to do. And then, um, but yeah, I think you know, putting all of these things in writing, in policies, so that different ins different departments within um, the city's operations have mandates and have to start following things. And then also, you know, that also provides an opportunity for citizens to track those those types of progress. Well, you promised that you do this, you voted on this, you approved this, you know, why aren't you following up? And that provides a little leverage for the community. The other thing I was gonna say, and I remembered I had one more thing, in regards to um, community involvement and equity is, looking to maybe, uh, and I don't know the entire scope of the um, participatory budgeting um, committee committee and budget that's within the city, because uh, I've only been here a couple of years, but it does seem to be mostly geared towards parks or something like that. But you could create within either that particular committee or you could create a new committee that allocates funding to energy saving projects within the city and so it would essentially work like the participatory budget pro committee, but be for greenhouse gas reductions. And that would be a really good way for social equity and community involvement. Interesting you should mention that. Um, one of the projects that was approved through the last round of participatory budgeting um, involved purchase of um, four or five um, portable uh, solar powered EV charging stations um, to be deployed at um, rec centers and so on. And on the, on the uh, street lamps uh, conversion, we currently have about 15% of the um, Duke Energy street lamps in the city have been converted over to LEDs and that project is ongoing. So over time that will um, you know, get phased you know, the, the old sodium uh, vapor and mercury vapor lamps will get uh, phased yeah. out. And yeah, I, I, and I work with ETSCO and, you know, that's one of the low hanging fruit projects that we have. You know, if we are, if we were able to re retrofit all of those with a snap of a finger, you know, close to 500 lights, that would be a 2% reduction in our carbon footprint right there. We're just stuck on a budget from three years ago and managing a pandemic and a new building that, you know, so. There's just a lot of things that are have been holding us back, but um, but yeah, I mean, lighting, putting, you know, and and doing the lead thing where we start making decisions for people. So you know, we've gotten rid of light switches in a lot of these buildings. They're all sent. They're all occupancy sensors, um, so that they're you know, the lights turn off automatically when somebody leaves the room. That's really important. Um, you know, not we advocate for behavior change, but we also try to subversively make those changes for people already, right? Um, putting, we've had a project in one of our dorms where we put uh, occupancy sensors attached to the HVAC system. Um, you know, I think you're just going to have to do an audit of the buildings if you haven't already. I'm sure you already have kind of a, but an idea of what your budget is for um, your deferred maintenance. <laughs> you know, we have a massive deferred maintenance budget um, here on campus as well. I mean, across the state, it's, it's always... People always talk about innovators making the difference, and really, it's it's maintainers. To be to be fair, it's the people doing the recycling, it's the people fixing leaks, it's the people swapping out light bulbs and stuff that are that are really going to make the difference. Um, I mean, we can't really count on uh, newfangled technology. We have everything available to us as far as technology is concerned to um, to start reducing our carbon footprint um, across all kinds of sectors. And it's, it's just really a matter of will and it's a matter of funding and 
maybe we'll start getting more of it from the federal government. Uh, federal and state governments seem to help move some of those things forward. Okay, thank you for right. your, <laughs> for listening to me. And uh, All right. but yeah, those are just some of the examples of what we're what we're aiming for here. Okay, Vicky, do we have some more uh, comments from the chat? Um. Margaret um, had suggested that, um, you know, maybe we look at um, places like UNCG, other North Carolina cities like Asheville and Durham that have been um, um, trying to reach renewable energy goals and study their plans. Um, and I let her know privately that we were already on that. And we'll put those plans out, not on the uh, city website, but on the team website for folks that are actually uh, join the you know part of the the energy team um for um the staff team yeah thank you um um and then uh the um one of the things sean had said about the uh, um the lighting um retrofits on outdoor lighting uh she just said that you know it would be great if um we could um, look at reducing light pollution from those lights too, which is something that was brought up at CSC a couple of months ago. So um, um, good point. Um, um, and then um, do, I see I already asked that one. Skip posted something, but it looks like he has responded to other people's comments. Um, and then Sean had just said that the problem with outdoor lighting is people's perception of their safety. It's never, you know, that's a one of the, obviously you've got to consider safety and efficiency and, um, so I think that's I, I think that we've got all that of the takes a whole different conversation that tenor takes a conversation when you start talking about uh, renewable energy and lighting and then on some part of the population talk about light pollution and then others uh, talk about safety and, and I specifically talk about some of the lights in my neighborhood where it's practically daylight at nighttime and uh, uh, not that it's not safe. I have live in a safe neighborhood, but uh, it's one of those that drowns out the, the light and you don't, uh, neighbors aren't concerned about that. They're more concerned about making sure they catch the people who are, who are breaking into cars and, and things like that. So that's a whole new conversation when you look at those kinds of disparities. Uh, I'm sorry, Vicki, to interrupt you very, very quickly. I wanna talk for two minutes. My name is Nicole Gaines. I serve on the CSC. I also serve with Sierra Club, so I'm an environmentalist, proud of it. Uh, I know a lot of folks on here. I know about grassroots. I serve with the North Carolina Climate Justice uh, Collective, and so we do a lot of talking, um, uh, not only with Duke Energy, but uh, we know that, as I believe it was uh, uh, Lawrence and some other people who had mentioned the elephant in the room, and I'm glad that Jeffrey uh, Page is here to kind of bear the brunt of some of these hard questions. Uh, when we look at Duke Energy, I know that I've been following on an environmental standpoint, the, uh, the actions that uh, our Attorney Ge General Jeff, uh, Josh Stein and along with the Sierra Club uh, held Duke Energy accountable for the coal ash spill. So we're looking for not any more settlement money coming out of taxpayer pockets, but where will that come from? So we don't, know how that's going to be paid for, but it, it will. So that needs a careful eye. Uh, so I'm glad this group is together and we and Jeff and Vicki, we're focusing on city operations and what the city can do. But the larger uh, question deals with uh, our entire community. It, it deals with the LEED silver certification that I'm proud of that we have. And it, it calls for being ready for the future and having a future for our children in the renewable energy future. So I'm glad that I have a lot of allies on this phone call that we know that we can have go left and we can go to the middle and we won't satisfy everyone. But I am so glad that uh, we are coming together and looking at all the benefits of, of, of what we can do to help the city meet its goals and to reach those communities, those uh, 
at, at risk, and I don't like the word at risk. There, there are people like uh, 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 Sean just mentioned at UNCG, they're underutilized and they need more at the ta table. Douglas Bender, I'm looking at you when we start talking about equity. Um, we started talking about uh, being sure that more BIPOC people are at the table and and doing this, engaging this conversation, not necessarily going through a workforce development uh, uh, agency, but you're actually pulling into those directly with those companies who, who, who do business with uh, uh, black and brown people. And, and uh, uh, not only that, but all kinds of people when you're looking at those kinds of a situation. So, uh, just very quickly, I'm I'm proud of uh, Jeff and the city and what everyone's been able to do, uh, and it's not done yet. I'm I'm hoping that this isn't the only session that we uh, have, Jeff, and and to get more people involved. I'm so glad also to see the human relation. Um, is that the same? Is that the name? I might have messed up on that again. What is it called, Douglas? Human. Rights. Human rights. Rights Human rights commission. I am very, very sorry. But just by that being on this call uh, and being interested in how our energy future is looking and and uh, uh, transportation and all the community working parts from the city um, is just the first step. So I'm very glad that I see everybody here. And that's all I have to say. Um, something that, uh, Nicole, you brought up and someone else brought up earlier about, I think this was Sean, about uh, historically underutilized or underrepresented businesses. I'm not sure I've heard it. Both that was later. Sean. It's, um, it's my understanding that the city, that our contracts are vetted and that there is a priority of some sort given. And I think Jeff or um, if uh, Kimberly's still on the phone could probably answer that better than me, but it seems like we do have a policy in place for that. Right, the city does have a minority and women owned business enterprise um, policy in place with specific um, goals for the percentage of inclusion of those uh, businesses in our contracting, both for services and procurement. Um, and uh, it, often becomes very difficult to um, secure contracts um, with enough firms. Um, there are so few out there that provide the types of services or um, uh, Well, do you know what, Jeff? It, in my opinion, it's I've been in this city for 30 years. And so if you see that happening, and if you know that is the kind of where we're looking at resources and within the black community or the, the minority community or minor women community, we are looking in the wrong spot because for 30 years, you can't use the same excuses. We just can't find the businesses uh, that will be able to handle these. So we have to put our heads together and find out where they are. And if we, we it no longer works that uh, we just don't have enough people. Um, if they are not, uh, whether it's trained or they're not available, those that argument perpetuates this 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 feeling that there isn't enough uh, minority-owned businesses to help. And I'm sure uh, there are. We just have to think of a better method well, to to reach them. And it may not be the case that there are not enough of those businesses in existence, but there aren't enough that have become certified as minority or women owned contractors um, through the system that does that certification. And if they're not certified, then we cannot um, uh, validly assert that, that we are meeting those um, targets and that we're hiring or, or contracting with the type of businesses that we're aiming to. Gotcha. And, and just, just to kind of tap onto that a little bit, it's also based on geographic presence too. So the, yeah. the minority businesses have to be within a geographic hub around Greensboro for the city to consider them an MWBE. So that's, like, that's the, the process that the city uh, uses for evaluation. Yeah, there's like uh, two dozen counties closest to Guilford County that are the 20, 20 counties out to Raleigh, almost down to Charlotte that are included in that hub. 
Right. I don't know the exact geographic area, but yeah. But they have to meet a certification process. Is that what you're saying, Jeff? Yes. Okay. They, they basically have to register um, as a minority and or women owned business. So Jeff, this is Doug Bender. What they are. I, uh, I promised myself I wasn't going to say anything, but I can't hold my peace any longer. <clears throat> So I, uh, uh, let me just probably be a bit more proper in introducing myself. I'm the chair of the Human Rights Commission. Um, that doesn't give me anything, any special uh, rights or privileges, but um, um, that's the context in which I'm on this, on this particular call. But I think I'd probably be on the call anyway if I knew this existed. First of all, I think you guys are doing, doing a great job so far with what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, however, one of the things that the pandemic has taught us, as well as all of the other sort of uh, uh, things that have happened in our lives over the course of the last year, year and a half or so, and that is the proliferation and the promulgation of, 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 of disparities <clears throat> is universal and continuing and widening unless and until we do something deliberately and intentionally to make that go away. And I strongly suspect that the millennials won't give us a get out of jail free card. So um, I wanna respond very specifically to that last point that you made. And I, I wanna echo Nicole's point. I, I happen to belong to a local organization that um, only, accepts, <laughs> only accepts professionals um, of a very high caliber at a very high level. And I strongly suspect that they all would, would, re would react the way that, that I just did in saying to Nicole's point, we have used this excuse for not just 30 years, but for the last several decades that they're just not there. Uh, I also come from a corporate background, by the way, in my previous life, I was a senior level corporate executive for some of America's most um, well-known brands. I won't go into any detail about that, except to say that that was, that was something that we wrestled with decades ago. Uh, we can't find them because they don't exist or they're just not there. <clears throat> they're there. But for those who are not there, I think they are really interesting and important ways that we can come together as a community to really help um, these uh, small businesses to um, get, get aligned with the requirements for the city or anybody else for that matter. I just think that we have to be uh, more thoughtful and more intentional about um, uh, how we're leading with our head and our heart. Uh, so, and further to that particular point, I'm gonna say this because uh, it, 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 uh, I posted it in the, uh, in the chat um, and just kind of let it sit there. Um, I think one of the ways that we, we, we ensure that we reach our beloved community in the way that I think we want to reach it is to make sure that we build into the work that we're doing, the plan and the work that we're doing, um, racial impact statements and the processes that go along with that so that we are not just uber sensitive about those things, but that we, we, um, we are conscious enough to make sure that our work involves all of those things. Just kind of referring to the resolution earlier, somebody did, that says that we, we, we want to ensure a just transition is not enough to be able to just kind of say that. I think we have to be really intentional and I think we have to codify the fact that we want to do some very specific things to make sure that, that we, uh, we're not um, unintentionally, because um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We're not unintentionally really trying to do good things, but having bad impact along the way. So I got, that's all I'm gonna say about that, but I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share a couple of words. I think this is really, really incredible work. I just think if we really wanna see it succeed the way we wanna see it succeed, then I think we have to have that conversation and not necessarily in this particular context, but maybe offline, somebody doing some real work. I'm happy to raise my hand to help out to make sure that we're thinking about the right kinds of things as we try to take on some of this stuff. This is a big, hairy, audacious goal anyway, from a technical standpoint. And I'm looking forward to learning an awful lot about sustainability and, 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 all, and all that goes with it. But in the meantime, we just wanna make sure that we don't leave significant chunks of our community behind so that we continue to, you know, sort of continue to, to, to shepherd unintentionally the same old results. So thank you guys for that. If I may add 
to what Mr. Bender said, I think the city ought to examine its criteria for finding companies that will do the work. And if one of the standards is you've got to have enough financial access so that you can carry your workers and your the materials you're buying. But if you're a small black business and you're not treated at the bank the same way a similar sized majority owned business or a larger business, then it's not a fair, it's not a, a level playing field. The city's got to think about what are the impediments in their system that makes it more difficult for small minority owned businesses to successfully gain contracts from the city? And it's not just the contracts. The city can also be sensitive to a large corporation getting business, getting a contract, but what's it doing with its subcontractors? Are they open to, and do they have different standards for who their subcontractors are? Well, and, and to clarify, it's the state of North Carolina that does the certification um, and it's their criteria. So um, that is in a very significant sense out of the control of the city of Greensboro to be able to determine what business does or does not qualify. That's significant, Jeff. I, this is Doug, that's significant to know. Um, and either way, regardless of whose requirement it is, I think, the, I think the same response still applies. I mean, because you guys, you guys are having to, again, live and breathe whatever those requirements are. And so um, you own a part of the challenge as well as a part of the opportunity. Um, so we can't offload it to just the state, but I really appreciate that point. And I have a couple of ideas that I think would actually be quite helpful in trying to, you know, trying to help us maybe get a little bit further down the road to success in this particular regard that, that uh, Mr. Morris is talking about. So I'm happy to have an offline conversation with you. Um, cause I, I, you know, I've lived all over the country and I know that there's some incredibly successful initiatives and programs underway that can really kind of help us kind of close the gap on this thing. We may not be able to do this overnight. We know we won't, but we can actually, we can get ourselves on a road that will allow us the opportunity to be, to have, you know, to be really proud of the, the way that we get, we've been intentional about what we do and Greensboro can help champion the way. Thank you. Excellent. Just want to say to everyone on the that has really talked a lot about equity um, throughout this um, uh, listening session. Um, I'm really appreciate hearing these voices, and you know, I'm really hoping that um, with uh, the um, the Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Office um, with the City of Greensboro that we can have participation from you. Um, your um, groups so that, and um, Nicole, I know um, will have her voice uh, through CSC, um, just so that we, we are always keeping that in, um, uh, we're mindful of that and that's um, in, in, in an intentional way. So I just wanted to say bravo. I know there's several people on the call. Uh, Alan, you made some really, uh, Hunt, you made some really wonderful points. So I just um, had to just chime in and just say, thank you. And don't forget our community colleges. I work at two and I'm proud of it. So don't forget of our workforce that needs, uh, they're on the ground, they're the ground uh, uh, workers there. You want someone to go into solar and renewable energy and hire from the city, don't forget our colleges. Good point, Nicole. Dr. Jill says so too. <laughs> Biden, Jill, Jill Biden. She's keeping her job at the community college. I'm always proud of our community colleges. Thought I saw a hand up. Um, 
Gary Kenton has a comment of Greensboro has no control over the criteria for eligible minority owned businesses um, that needs to be fixed. It's a convenient way to avoid the crucial issues. So my understanding, Jeff, was you were saying that this is um, kind of at, at a state level. Do we have a way to tweak that at a local in a through our local government? <laughs> or do we know that? Is that There's, ever? I mean, the, the certification is at the state level. Once a business is certified, then they're eligible for contracting with the city as an MWBE. That doesn't, not being certified as an MWBE doesn't prevent them from gaining contracts with the city, but it prevents us from counting that as our meeting our MWBE goals. So there, there's an important distinction there. And also, um, you know, I wonder if, you know, we could certainly explore this with the MWBE office, the city's MWBE office, but, you know, look at the possibility of, you know, saying something like, if you initiate the process of becoming certified um, at the time you, you know, respond to a, an RFP, we can, we can take that as evidence of at least on a contingent basis of your being a certified MWBE firm. And if it turns out after the fact, we'll just, you know, back that out of the percentages, but still be able to, you know, move forward with that contractor, um, you know, and, and maybe along the way help them through that process. Um, anyway, I, I'm I'd not having, you know, anyone from our MWBE office uh, here today, I'm just speculating, but um, there are certainly always opportunities for improving um, our processes, policies, and procedures. So Jeff, as, as someone, I just wanna react real quickly, as someone who has owned businesses and as someone who currently chairs a, a small but fairly successful business in Houston, Texas, let me, let me just say, I, I don't I don't want necessarily for the requirement to go away. What I do want though is to is to be able to um, to have a, a fair shot, if you will, at being able to meet the, the the requirements. In other words, I don't want you to lower the bar for me at all. I think that I can compete on whatever level the bar is, but at the end of the day, be, again, because of historic disparities, um, and discrimination, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that, that some of these organizations just may simply need some help in reaching that bar. And that's okay. We train people all the time. I've heard Nicole reference several times now, you know, the technical and community colleges. I love technical and community colleges. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that that's the point. It's, it's not so much just necessarily trying to eliminate the requirement. If it's a legitimate requirement, I'm, I'm good with those. But what I, what I, 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 think we can't do is just kind of you know just sit by and 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 just just try to let them figure it out because most of them can and again we you know we saw some of that impact even with the pandemic I, I know for a fact that that across this country a number of minority and women-owned mm -hmm. businesses there was a, a very a, a significant disparate impact on those folks who tried to get emergency loans and, and business loans and help and support that happened to a lot of people that I know personally all across the country should not have been, but for the fact that these banks and these organizations, these very sundry other organizations had these certain requirements that they didn't even really know they had to meet to begin with. So, 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 I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to leave this conversation really having anybody think that we're going to, we're going to, we're going to change the, the playing field uh, to to uh, allow, allow people to appear as an organization to appear as if though they're, they're, they're getting a handout. We're not looking for handouts in 2021. We're looking for a hand. Excellent points. We There's a couple of other suggestions on the chat just about, again, this same topic, um, pulling in the community colleges, um, um, uh, maybe the chamber could partner with the city to help this happen. Um, 
you know, just to provide some training. Oh, this started with, with Sean to provide a training program to walk companies through the process of getting certified and then maybe work with the Chamber of Commerce. And I want to add to that, even like the small business center here in Greensboro, um, where a lot of these people would probably be interacting possibly. Um, and um, uh, Jean Pudlow mentioned uh, maybe uh, courses in solar technology at GTCC. It's my understanding that GTCC has not offered that program, but that program I do believe is offered in Alamance Community College. It may be something that we could, you know, uh, talk to, to, to them about. Um, but, um, and then someone said, maybe we need a community college at the table. So maybe we could reach out to their workforce development office um, um, to see if, if they want to get involved in this project. Eric, did you want to say something? Yes, I would. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm on a different topic, so I didn't want to interrupt. But, yeah, my name is Eric Kelly. Uh, I'm a 17-year-old beekeeper and environmentalist from Winston-Salem. And uh, my proposal today is that to reduce our carbon footprint and save gas, we need to plant clover on the side of our highways. Now, the reason being is that clover only grows to about five inches tall, so it doesn't need to be mowed. Now, if you think about it, all the miles and miles of highways and medians and sides that needs to be mowed by tractors, it takes up a lot of fuel. Also, uh, while saving gas, planting clover would benefit our pollinators and honeybees. Now, when you go to the farmer's market and you buy honey, about a third of that is made of clover. So it's a very big food source for our bees. Now, yeah, if we wanna reduce our carbon footprint, we need to look into this, you know, planting clover. I think it would help out a lot. What a great idea, yeah. um, Eric. I'm a beekeeper and we just planted uh, about five acres of clover in a big field around our bees, so. Excellent idea. Thank you for that great idea. Especially coming from Winston-Salem. Um, uh, Jean Pudlow, uh, city, uh, Chris Rivera and city director of workforce development could be a good partner and may know who at GTCC would be good. Um, we're going to um, download all of these comments in the chat. We'll have a transcript of this so we, we can capture all of this, uh, all these great contacts. So we really appreciate, um, uh, you know, uh, everybody brainstorming all this. It seems to be a really um, a topic that's important to everyone or a lot of us. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent comments. Um, looks like Alan has his hand up again. Yeah, I just just briefly, because I know everybody wants to get dinner, or at least I know I do. Uh, so, um, but I love what Eric had to say. Um, I come from a family that is, I don't know, lack of better words, it's going to sound hippie-ish, granola. Um, and, and we make a lot of our own food and things like that. And, and that's just sort of personal practice. But I, I really believe um, in some of those practices he was mentioning. One thing I didn't say earlier is um, I've really studied over the last few years on my own, on just my own hobby, I guess, uh, alternative building practices. I, I've been not only in my fair housing manager, investigator type person working with HUD, but um, I've really been in that industry of, of rental management as well. And so one of the things I've, I've definitely come across in my studies has been the use of alternative building materials and even some ancient building materials. Um, that are highly um, energy efficient and um, also at a much much uh, cheaper cost than a lot of the modern conventional materials that we um, are employing in, in building these beautiful efficient buildings. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, to um, you know clap hands for Eric and also just introduce that idea of you know code um, just code exceptions and things like that to uh, as we look at. Um, buildings that cannot be upcycled, buildings that maybe need to be uh, cleared out. And then we look into um, maybe, maybe new, new uh, building structure, you know, that we think maybe beyond um, just the conventional housing styles or materials and look into um, building structures that include, you know, recycled buildings. I know of several structures that I've studied that are completely recycled, made of plastic. I mean, all kinds of things. I saw a house that was made of tires. Um, you know, these things are not as uh, futuristic 
or as far out as they used to be perceived. And I think that is something, if it were ignored, I think it'd be a missed opportunity. It also is a job creation opportunity. Thank you. And a possibility to use materials that might otherwise land in the end up in the landfill, which is. Okay, um, looks like Etsco has her hand up. Go ahead. Hi, um, I just wanted to uh, make a general comment that um, however we proceed in this energy plan that when we talk about the equity, uh, we also have to think about the sort of downstream communities, not just uh, Greensboro, you know, how we, right now we uh, outsource our trash. We send our trash to another community miles away and that's really not solving the problem. So um, I think it's important to think about equity in a broader sense, not just to, for the sake of Greensboro, but in a larger community, which to me also includes beyond the human, um, the, uh, what we call environment. Environment is not really an environment. You know, we, our oppression, the oppression we, we violence we do to the minority communities in the human world is deeply connected to the violence we do to the natural world. So I think we have to um, consider all these things together as we move forward, as, uh, as we know that Native American communities think about, you know, when, we, when they make decisions, they think about generations ahead. And I think that's how we have to start thinking about any kind of decisions from now on if we, if we want to make uh, a change, so. Excellent points. The, the geographic impact of our community's resource consumption extends far beyond its geographic boundary. Um, Skip had a comment about um, promoting uh, clean, en inter mm, clean energy curricula at GTCC um, and possibly um, Guilford College since they're um, kind of uh, having some difficulties right now. Maybe um, a, some new curriculum might help them. I think that's I've caught up on the chat's comments now. Uh, I just wanna make a reminder, if there's anyone that's um, interested in working on the uh, plan um, as a community member in some way, if you could just put something in the chat and let us know in what way you would like to participate. If you have like a specific um, thought in mind of something that you wanna work on, or if you would like to be on kind of one of the working uh, groups, um, just give us a general idea or, you know, if you just want to participate by showing up at the listening session and, and give an input like this, I mean, we're, you're welcome to do either, but uh, we do want to um, um, make that available and um, uh, we welcome your comments either way. Absolutely. And, and this is not the last uh session of this type that we will have uh, throughout the process. And, and uh, there will probably be um, two, three, possibly four more um, broad sessions like this, uh, where we try to uh, provide information on where things are um, in the process and, and what has been um, put together, assembled so far. And we will provide um, any update uh, that we have at each of the uh, official uh, community sustainability council meetings, which are on the second Monday of every month. 
So, um, and if you're not already on the interested parties list, um, you can reach out in the email to with the, leave your email address and just put interested party. We'll add you to the interested party list. And then you will be aware of any of the updates of the CSC meetings uh, and then any other um, meetings related to this um, that would um, that you might be interested in. Um, uh, Etsco, um, Ken Fuji had a question, um, and we, we addressed this earlier, but maybe we didn't do a good enough job. Um, was what um, what are the kind of working groups going to be? It just really broadly, I don't um, want to pull the slide back up, but um, water, waste, transportation, buildings, and lighting are kind of just really the broad. And it will probably narrow from that when we get into, um, to really start getting into the nitty gritty. So, you know, if you're really interested in energy versus, um, or, or transportation or uh, uh, I know I've got a couple of waste people on here. Um, so just put something in the, um, the chat or feel free to reach out to us. But definitely if you wanna get on the interested parties list, that'll be the best way for you to really um, stay up to date on any meetings or anything that we're doing. And we definitely are grateful for all of you who have uh, taken your time to be here today and participate in this uh, session and sharing your comments and questions and information. Um, it's been a really um, very energizing uh, conversation. And uh, I think it says good things about where this planning process is headed. I echo what Jeff said. I just um, think we've got um, a lot of passion for this and not just passion, but also really um, people with, with backgrounds in this and, and, and you really care about it. So I really hope that all of you will find a way to stay engaged in this process and help us um, 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 make this energy plan um, something that the entire community can be proud of. I see uh, lots of um, people adding their interested parties. So when we capture the uh, transcript, Jeff, we'll uh, you know, keep you busy for a little bit. Yes. This is good. And again, mark your calendars on the second Monday of, um, is every other month, so we just met. So the next meeting will be March, right. um, our next CSC meeting. So it's, um, I don't have the date, but it's the second Monday in March um, from uh, 4 to 6 p.m. And of course, that'll be on Zoom because that's the world we live in right now. Any other last minute comments? We got just a couple of minutes left. And if you're if you're um, mentioning in the chat that you want to be involved in one of the working groups, please um, give some indication of what uh, topic area you're um, interested in or topic areas. That would be helpful. It's slowed down. Winding down here. Yes, it's winding down. Um, any last comments? Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't get to speak on the call. I, I, I abused, I guess, the chat because there's there's too many chat words. But uh, just as a quick summary up from my own personal perspective, I'm, I'm acutely interested in big picture, picture issues, one, one such being nuclear, which I did voice in the chat. Another being, I don't know how to go about it, but uh, essentially putting up a no vacancy sign at Greensboro and try to reduce our population rather than increase it. I don't think that's exactly a, 
the hottest topic on the earth and, and probably not one that's very popular with a lot of folks, but it needs to be said. There's, there's whatever, 8 billion people on this earth and can only sustain two. So what are we going to do about it? And then the last thing, my, well, my life's work has been in transportation. I didn't hear much of that on this call, but uh, I, for one, would be interested to join any uh, transportation-oriented uh, issues to save uh, carbon, fuel, and, and basically produce a better transportation system. Uh, I, I say that with 58 years of experience in the, mainly the trucking industry, but that's where I come from. As well, you we, we welcome you to join our transportation group. So uh, we would love your input, Skip. Thank you. Indeed. All right, with, with uh, just about a minute left, I guess we are going to uh, adjourn this meeting uh, unless there's uh, anyone else with a last uh, comment or question. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, folks. And uh, we will be back in touch soon. Take Thank care. you very much.